Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. With e-commerce off the charts, many small and growing warehouses are asking, how can I get ahead when my warehouse is barely keeping up? The answer is future-ready warehouse tech from Zebra Technologies. Warehouses can simplify and upgrade all processes, from automated inventory management to hands-free picking with Zebra's tailored, scalable mobile solutions. They're simple and intuitive. There's never been a better time to upgrade for success with Zebra. How can your warehouse get ahead? The answer's in black and white. Get the answers at zebra.com slash the answer. That's zebra.com slash the answer. Fulfillment demand continues to skyrocket and outpace available labor. To keep up, warehouse operators are turning to flexible fulfillment solutions like Six River Systems. Utilizing Six River Systems' award-winning combination of collaborative robots, artificial intelligence, and operational expertise will make your associates and wall-to-wall fulfillment workflow more efficient. No new infrastructure, no change to warehouse layout, easy to deploy and scale, easy to train and retain associates, all at half the cost of traditional automation. Want to take your fulfillment operation to the next level go to www.sixriver.com to learn more that's www.sixriver.com to learn more how do you create warehouse superheroes the answer is simple with visual voice scan solutions from pro census with record demand and labor shortages warehouses need more effective workers and lightning fast onboarding visual voice scan solutions from pro census enable warehouse workers to achieve superhero performance with up to 20 percent improved productivity and up to 99 percent accuracy hands-free barcode scanners from ProGlove paired with wearable mobile computers is just the beginning improved mobile interfaces with reduced keystrokes easy to read screens custom keyboards voice enabled interface and more can be realized with ease on the leading wms platforms sound too good to be true let us show you with our one-of-a-kind virtual demo visit prosensus.com to get started today again that's prosensus.com to get started The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hello, and welcome to our panel today on building a sustainable supply chain. My name is Kevin Lawton. I am the host and founder of the New Warehouse Podcast, which focuses on logistics, distribution, transportation topics within that setting. And we have a podcast twice a week that covers those topics. Today, we're going to focus on the sustainable side of supply chain, and we're going to have three guests on the panel. Our first guest is Nate Faust, who has spent the past decade leading teams that have built next generation e-commerce experiences that includes with diapers.com. He's also a co-founder and was the COO for jet.com, which led him to be the senior vice president of Walmart's US e-commerce supply chain. And he is now on a mission to reduce packaging waste in the shipping and returns process as the CEO and founder of Olive. We also have Yossi Sheffi, who has a long history in the supply chain world, and he's currently the director of the MIT Center for Logistics and Transportation, along with being an author of several books in the supply chain space. And our last panelist is Hanko Kiesner. He is the executive chairman and founder of PackSize, which brings automated and intelligent solutions to packaging for the supply chain world. He has a passion for making the supply chain smarter, when it comes to packaging in a sustainable way. So I want to welcome our panelists to the virtual stage here. Welcome, guys. So we're going to talk about sustainability, and there's a lot of things to talk about in regards to that. And we all have our own ideas about sustainability 
and how we may define it. But one of the large things is the challenge of actually pursuing sustainability. So I want to start the questions off with asking the panelists, where do we think we are in the pursuit of a more sustainable supply chain? So I guess I will give it to Hanko if you want to start off with that question. I, I would say that we are probably not far at all. Um, I, I have not seen a supply chain that is sustainable today. I think we have to pick up the speed significantly. And my definition of sustainability is that you must be able to do it forever. And if you cannot do it forever, then it is not sustainable. And I have not seen a supply chain that can run forever the way that we have that set up at the moment. Okay, great. And Yossi, what do you think? Where are we at? I'd like to hear from everybody on kind of our, our level set of, of where we think we are in progress, if any progress, in sustainability. I find it uh, astounding that I agree with Henko. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the place that, that we are nowhere, that the size of the challenge compared to our progress is uh, we're just not get, not going to get there. The way, the way things are going. But I feel also probably unlike Henko and, and Nate, my, my, my guess, is that uh, even our efforts today are close to meaningless in terms of getting us to where we need to go. I mean, there was just an article in the Financial Times today about most companies are just greenwashing. Nobody's really doing something for real. And that's, so we can go on and on about it, but as long as consumers are really just talking and not willing to actually do something, companies are just going to continue, you know, rewarding people and giving bonuses based on economic performance and governments, despite good intentions, I don't think will be able to do something again that the citizens don't want to do. So we have to, fundamental change, we can talk later about what it is, but. I agree with you. Unbelievable. (laughs) Yes. So we will get into some of the challenges and how we can go about changing those as well. But let's hear from Nate on his thoughts as well, kind of where we're we're starting out here. Sure. So I feel there's marginal progress being made in in certain areas, but there's a few challenges, you know, namely that most sustainability initiatives result in either higher cost or compromises for customers. And I think that's really what needs to be the long-term paradigm shift to drive to, to drive true sustainable supply chains is there need to be new technologies that do drive down costs simultaneously with in you know improving sustainability and also new customer experiences that can be created that are at the intersection of a better customer experience aligned with with sustainability, which, you know, not to go into that too much detail now, but that's sort of the, the, the bucket that, that Olive fills in, falls into. Okay. Definitely. And we'll definitely get into some discussion about the technologies that are happening out there to, to help us become more sustainable or, or trying to help us in that way. But I think, you know, it seems like we can all agree that there's certainly some challenges here but going about them and how do we tackle these challenges, I think there may be some differing opinions where we can have some interesting discussions. So, so there's many ways, you know, that we've gotten to this point overall, which we could spend tons of time talking and reflecting on the past and what's been happening. But I think with sustainability, we need to focus on moving forward and how do we do things to become to that point and, and move forward with sustainability as a whole. So uh, I'm curious to hear from you guys on your you mentioned, I think, somewhere in there, I think it was Yossi, about the mindset. Uh, and I'm curious to hear from you about how do we start to shift that mindset? And I think let's start, you know, first talking about the mindset of actually doing the environmental savings. And I think, Yossi, you, you threw in there the word uh, greenwash as well, right? So how do we do the mindset of maybe the marketing side and the branding of going green or becoming sustainable versus actually making that a practice that is not only sustainable environmental wise, but sustainable as a business model too. I'll open that up to whoever wants to take it. I'll I'll take it first, just to make it interesting as I always try to do. 
Okay, the question is not uh, the right question because you assume it can be done. Even Nate assumes it cannot be done. He doesn't say it, but he wants, if you ask him, you want A and B, Nate says, I want A and B. So, yeah, okay, maybe he wants both something that's economically viable and sustainable. That sounds like a panacea. Maybe that's zero, zero point something, you know, uh, likelihood that, that we'll get there in any time frame that makes sense. I mean, sure, 200 years, 200 years, we can get there, but any time frame that, that, uh, that will help the problem. And the issue is, again, that the basic issue is consumers, despite what they say, are not willing to do it. As I said, when everything said and done, a lot more is said than done. So that's true about consumers. That's true about the companies. It's even true about most governments. But, but, so the question is, what do you do about it? And, and, and by the way, the proof in the pudding is the, is the pandemic. We had, we had at, at least the U.S., more than a third of people are not willing to take vaccines, wear masks, uh, social distance. This is thing that can save their life can save the life of the children, and they are, they are not willing to do it because they don't perceive it as a risk. Now, you're going to take these people and convince them that something that will happen decades from now is a real risk. Where is the evidence that this even should be attempted? I mean, anyway, so my, my solution, we can talk about it later, is fundamental, and by the way, also, motivated by, by the pandemic, is fundamental investment in technology and investing these hundreds of billions of dollars and trillions of dollars in technology that can take uh, GAG out of the air. Because also, just one more point, we also have the whole developing world that wants to get developed. They want air conditioning cars and, and eat meat and, 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 you know, concrete houses. So we are doomed. Unless we have some technology, because we cannot tell them don't. We, we have it, but you guys are not allowed to have air conditioning. So we must have, we must change the paradigm. We should, we should not ask, how do we convince them? Because this is a fool's errand, I think. I said, they're not willing to do it. My God, they're, they're morons, but it is, it is what it is. That, by the way, I use a technical term from MIT. It's not, you should not use it. So <laughs> that's a technical term. <laughs> so, I mean, it, I mean, it seems like we're somewhat in agreement here that it, from the consumer spot side and the perspective of the consumer, it's a change on their side that needs to be made. But it sounds like a large challenge to be able to make that change. I mean, even if, you know, we go with Henko's idea of making that pollution cost on to the consumer for a two hour delivery, I mean, do we think that that will actually kill uh, two-hour delivery demand, or do we think that consumer behavior will still create that demand, which is essentially creating more waste, right? Yeah, it might actually kill the demand for that specific service, but then at least you have fair competition between the different supply chain modes. Yeah, I, I think the challenges, though, Hanko, those, those things, as you started out discussing around sort of negative externalities and socialism on the cost side, those things don't have real costs. They could have costs that are applied by governments. But I would say in terms of influencing customer behavior, it's less about sort of the, the, the stick and more of the carrot. How can you incent customers to choose more sustainable options because there's benefits and those could be lower prices because you're as a company avoiding those taxes or other benefits that you can you can bake into your your service that are you know, simultaneously superior and more sustainable but i think ultimately in order for companies to be able to create those incentives to pass through they have to have the same incentives put on them either through the just the market or in this case, since those aren't marketable prices around greenhouse gas emissions, prices that are effectively put upon them by, you know, through, through regulation. We'll be back after a quick break. 
You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, and, and we, we, we are going to see this. There's a natural experiment. You know, the EU is trying to do it, a version of this including the border tax to be able to, to make sure, because the main problem here is you make your companies less competitive worldwide. So they do, they, they try to do it. It's extremely difficult. And we'll see if the European are willing to pay, especially the Southern European are willing to pay more for, uh, for lots of stuff. We also see, just like happened when Angela Merkel put in the, you know, got rid of all the nuclear plants after Fukushima and, you know, price of electricity went up and everybody was happy until they realized that all the big companies, you know, the auto, the German auto company, BSF, all, all these other companies were getting discounts on, <laughs> on the price of energy because they were big and had a lot of employment. There's a politics involved in this. So it, it makes it very hard. Okay. So I think we're, we're talking about large challenges here. And I think, you know, the panel is focused on building a sustainable supply chain. So, some of our, I guess, audience members are probably wondering how are we going to tackle some of these larger challenges and how can we internally as an individual uh, or as a company be able to start to move in that direction? And when we talk about governmental changes and regulations and all these different things, that's not something that necessarily one company or one person can, can begin to change. So how do you think that companies can start to internalize small incremental changes that will lead to overall a culture of sustainability within the, that individual company, at least, and start to move the ball forward, however slowly it may be, but in a positive direction? How do you think that they can begin those types of things? Well, maybe I, maybe I take that one. Uh, Sure. For for pack size, this is actually not that hard because being sustainable or aspiring to be as as sustainable as possible, but that was one of the founding principles when I moved from Germany here to the United States and started the company. So, so that train of thought made it into the culture of the company on day one, and we have ever lived uh, the principle of. Whatever the most sustainable way is, that is what we will do, even if it may cost a little bit more on the surface. But in the long term, if you include, and I actually take the liberty of including negative externalities into our own thinking at size, and I wouldn't be proud of, of a company that does not actually have a positive line after you subtract all of the negative and externalities and the cost to societies of us conducting our business. So I know we are far away from that. Yossi, I totally agree. We are not anywhere near and we are still far away, but I can only focus on the decisions that are in, in our own control here at size. And then we have, of course, the solutions to our customers, which have, which have actually the biggest benefit to the total sustainability advantage, which I can demonstrate to you here in a couple of minutes. Okay, so let me let me be even more controversial, not enough, because you seem to agree with me way too much. So <laughs> I think what you're doing is dangerous. What you and Nate are doing are dangerous because you are doing what you're doing and you are evangelizing this and going and talking about it. So people think out there that there's progress and people feel good about, oh, there are some industry leaders doing something about it. My guess is that uh, in terms of your work, sustainable, not sustainable, the percentage that you can save in terms of emission is minuscule. Relatively speaking, if you look at your total supply chain and how much you can save, it's just small. Just how many levers do you have? So, but I look at any big manufacturing company. It's so, so limited what they can actually do. But everybody, and as I said, the FT today talk about 70, 
eighty percent of the company, you know, it's, it's a good. They talk well. They do squat. Another technical term from MIT, but it's a. Um, they just. I come back back to the issue that there's also a time element here. If we, if we are not, you know, accelerate significantly the advances and keep talking and keep having Paris and Glasgow and, and all of this, when people are sitting and talking and, and making, making agreement that nobody intends to fulfill, I mean, it's just spending time instead of investing and, and looking at, okay, how, and look, let me just say, I'm not suggesting that not to do what, what you're doing, what Nate are doing, what other companies are doing. And you can become a benefit corporation. There are very few, by the way, and have your shareholder understand that this is where you're going. And there are some, some, some companies who do it, who say they believe in ESG and they become benefit corporation. So investors don't expect them to only maximize shareholder return. Fair enough. There are a few of those. Very, very few. So I, I just don't, and, and they usually sell upscale. You know, Patagonia is more expensive and sell upscale. Okay, they can, they can withstand it. Walmart cannot become a benefit corporation despite Nate's effort. I mean, it's just not in its DNA. Can't do it. So come back to the huge investment in, uh, in technology. So, so Nate, what do you what do you think about that? Coming from a, a company that's trying to uh, move. So, so you see, we, we've 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 chatted enough that I I don't take offense to your 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 comments. I know you you oh you, you know, know, you know that the, I'm doing you can the conversation, but you know I think I think we'd be in a worse world if we didn't have people who were truly out there trying to put forth simultaneous economically viable and more sustainable business offerings, because I do think it is the private sector that solves most problems. And those problems are solved through market-based solutions. And there are such inefficiencies in supply chains in general because of the lack of, you know, from a theoretical perspective, the lack of collaboration and the amount of fragmentation. And in the case of what our long-term vision at Olive is, if you can get more collaboration, both across supply chains, but also in line with customers, there's huge amounts of waste that can be eliminated. And, you know, to your comment before about, yeah, there's, there's huge companies out there that can, you know, deliver things together across multiple retailers, those companies being, you know, UPS and FedEx, that's absolutely true, but they only focus on the retailer side of the equation. They, they're, they're doing some things on the consumer side with, you know, like UPS My Choice and FedEx Delivery Manager, where there's, you know, what are really cost savings and more sustainable for customers that they can go pick up their packages at, you know, a, a location. But then there's also greenhouse gas emissions for that customer to drive to that location. So who knows what the net sustainability impact is. But it's really about bringing everything together, the retailers and the consumers, into a more collaborative supply chain. And you know that's our long-term vision and something that these sort of larger, pure logistics companies are, are less focused at on the influencing of the, the the customer behavior side of things. And that's where I think you can, there, there are huge amounts of waste that can be eliminated. Nate, don't misunderstand me. I admire what you do. I admire what Henko is doing. I admire what, you know, what Patagonia is doing. I do. I, look, I'm trying in my own life to ex, uh, to ex sustainability. I just know that my action and watching Netflix have the same effect on on, on sustainability in the world. So I'm not I'm not living in an yeah. illusion that I make a difference. I no, mean, I know, but but but, but you'll see. I would I would put that in the world of the sort of like people who say what one vote doesn't make a difference, so they don't vote. And if everybody did that, then you wouldn't have sort of fair democratic outcomes to elections. And I'll be honest, you know, just like I today, mean, what's that? 
Yeah. Well, let's, let's, not, let's, not get into that. let's not get into that's a whole different topic. But the point is, that every vote <laughs> does count. And okay. every yeah. little, even though it's little things, it's a lot of little things that will add up to progress. But you're right, they're not adding up fast enough. And incentives from governments and others that could enable greater progress faster so that all those little things can, can add up. I think is the 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 only way that's that that's ultimately. But achieved. but but you see the biggest technology that already operating is renewable. Renewables are now getting to the point that at some places they are competitive with the price of carbon. So you see the technology can have an effect and can have a significant effect, right? Building a Tesla is a technological marvel. So there the are things that technology can can do. The question is, where do we, where is the next wave of technology that will actually change or, or get us a, accelerate the progress towards sustainable future? Because the problem is, it's going. When you say it's going slow, people think it's going at half speed. No, it's going at one percent of the required speed. That's my problem. Not that it's you know too slow, like fifty miles per hour instead of seventy miles per hour. No. It's standing. It's almost standing in place versus seventy miles an hour, maybe one mile per hour. Um, Yossi, I totally agree with that, and pr I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I disagree with you on other topics. But uh, Nate, how about? <laughs> but Nate, how about if we demonstrate to the audience uh, multiple examples uh, from from Olive, but also from Pack Size, uh, some examples of sustainability? And I would like to start with with how how packaging is normally shipped. And you know how this works. You order something and then it is like a huge box. And then I ordered like some trees here, some some seeds of trees, a t-shirt, and then also some pens. And if this was all packaged, what I would call more sustainable, of course, not uh, probably the, then it would have been packaged like this, right? I mean, this is this is sort of pretty cool. And then we can put also, like a nice little sleeve around it here. Like we have some on-demand printing. Like Nate, how do you like that? That looks great, Hank. So then, <laughs> then we can put a sleeve around it. And uh, before I hand this over to Nate, so so we are Yossi, we are going to demonstrate a new virtual supply chain here. But uh, before I do this, when you have right size packaging, you're using forty percent less shipping volume on the average. You're reducing the corrugated consumption by 28%. You're using, if you now do this extrapolated for all of the United States, 5.8 million tons of paper are used too much. And guess how many trees we need to make 5.8 uh, million tons of paper? We need 98 million trees every single year. But now you have to imagine that these trucks are now also full by volume and not full by weight, which means that we have actually... 24.3 million truckloads that are cruising around the United States completely unnecessary only because packaging is too large. And that burns 1.74 billion gallons of diesel. And that leaves 17.4 billion kilograms of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. And yeah, this is just too slow. I, I, I actually agree with you, Yossi. <laughs> so, so I'm going to agree, but, but Nate, here, I'm going to send this through this uh, uh, transport. I'm going to send this over now, over to the eastern United States from Salt Lake City. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Hank. I'm not sure I feel about the olive logo being on cardboard, but this is definitely a you know a, a very nice right sized box. You know, having having spent you know sort of a decade managing various e-commerce supply chains. I know full well the the sheer amount of corrugate waste with you know average space utilization in a box around sixty percent, and the costs of that you know making up five to ten percent of supply chain costs spent just on on packaging in e-commerce, and you know that's why we feel you know in the long term the real solution is the the, the complete elimination of disposable packaging where you can create a more circular network of of reusable packaging hopefully with you know 
similar functionality of right sizing, probably not down to the same right sizing as yours, but with, you know, different, different mechanisms to allow, you know, reduce space and complete, complete reuse. And you know, that's really the, the, the long-term vision of Olive is to work with the same retailers that are, you know, spending hundreds of millions on packaging today and reduce that dramatically while providing something that is, is simultaneously a superior, superior customer experience where they don't have to deal with the waste either. I'm not going to have, have an example of, uh, you know, doing something like this because I think that this is, uh, you know, in some sense dangerous because you, uh, people who listen to this think there's real progress and there ain't. I mean, there's real progress, of course, when you start to come, what, it's, it's exactly, Henko, it's exactly what Nate said. You know, if I can do something that's both sustainable and costless and, and great service, everybody will use it. Yes, of course. You don't even need to say sustainable. If somebody can do something that's costless and, and great service, they'll do it. That's, that, that is the competitive marketplace. That, so it's, it's not, that, that's the anti-socialism, you know, a point of view but uh, right now it's obviously hard to do in some cases it's almost impossible if you think about for example airline it's 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 very hard so i think at the end of the day we need to get gag out of the air and there'll be another huge technological move just like all the renewables that uh and one thing we lost, this is the, the nuclear energy. I mean, it's absolutely, that's what gets me very, very pessimistic because it's the same people, the same Greens who did not want to use nuclear energy using the argument that, you know, the stuff is getting still active 10,000, 20,000 years from now. What? The world is going to come to an end 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. You're worried about 10,000 years? I mean, we'll find solutions, you know, in 10,000 years. So it's the same greens that now you expect to run the, the Green New Deal or all on the other. So I'm very skeptical. So I tend to maybe believe in, in technology. Of course, I, I know you're going to say technology can be for good, for bad. Of course, I understand that. But I think that we will need a huge technological leap here, a global effort. Because it's a global problem, just like the pandemic. It's a global problem. We need a global effort for everybody. And I just don't see any other solution. So it's not that I'm against, against what everybody is doing. I'm doing it myself just to feel good, honestly, to feel good. But it's uh, to feel that I'm a responsible citizen. But I'm not, con I'm not trying to, to think that what I'm saying that what I'm doing makes a difference because I'm looking at this 40%, 35% of the U.S. who don't wear masks and don't want to be vaccinated and say, we're doomed. So it's, <laughs> it's, we, need, we, we need to do it despite of all these, all these people. Okay. Interesting points all around. And I didn't know about this uh, virtual demo supply chain. So very, very cool stuff that you guys very uh, collaborate. Cool. I mean, I mean, Yossi, you didn't get a package. I didn't get a package, right? So uh, we got to get a package for ourselves. Right? No, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I got a package and I decided not to use it. I thought it's misleading. So I'm not, no, I didn't get a package. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, certainly, obviously, we're establishing that this is a huge challenge, right, to be taken on. And I think we have different sides of the spectrum here that, you know, we can make incremental challenges as solution providers, which Hanko and Nate are doing, or we can make consumer behavioral changes, which we have to count on the consumer to do, which I think we all agree that it's incredibly difficult to make that happen and make people still have the same level of service that they expect with also doing good things for, for the environment and the world. But I think, you know, closing out here and really kind of as a, a takeaway for everybody, you know, if we look at the next 
three to five years, five to 10 years to get any kind of progress whatsoever. And I think, you know, we agree that progress is slow. You'll see what's extremely slow at the 1%, right? So, you know, what do we need to do as stakeholders in this environment and this globe? What do we absolutely need to do starting now and within to the next years to see some type of progress, whether it's incrementally or more than at the pace we're moving now, what do we need to do in order to move that ball and, and get some momentum going forward? And I'll start with Yossi, since you guys started with your uh, virtual demo earlier. That's okay. I love this demo. Look, tell you one thing that we should do. We should dial down the alarmist. It sounds counterintuitive but we should dine down the alarmist media. There's enough trouble going on right now. And one has to acknowledge, for example, that some of the issues with fires in California, for example, are to very poor forest management and because people are living in places that they shouldn't be living in. So uh, there was expansion and all of this. It's, so where it's coming from and to say that everything is global warming, the reason that I'm saying this is I think, I, and I think that people are doing it, the media are doing it with good intention. They think that the crying wolf will help. I think it will have the opposite effect. I think, think we will come to 2030 and the United States will still be there. It's not, you know, cities are not going to be flooded yet. Maybe Shanghai will start having higher water, but, but it, it's just not going to happen. That's good. People who don't believe in global warming, they'll have their proof. They'll have the proof and we will be in a worse situation than we are now. So I would say, let's get out accurate information on what's going on with the frequency of uh, hurricanes, with the, with the fires, with the floods. The floods in Germany were not the first time in a century that this happened. I mean, so get the problem is the media is using it in order to, you know, build up the case. And I think they're doing a disservice because the way, whenever there's a problem, the best leadership is to give the most accurate information you can. And I think we're not doing this. And I'd like, I'd like us to start doing this. So do you think in a sense, the media coverage that you're speaking of is, is somewhat numbing the consumers to the reality of what's actually going no, on? No, it, it, it is numbing and it is setting, it, uh, setting us up for failure. That's my mm. problem. That I can just imagine on Fox News, 2030, they'll have all the, the congressmen from the, the senator from Massachusetts and, and from Oregon and from all the, you know, the, uh, the progressive state talking about the fact on the previous IPCC report, they read it wrong, by the way, just, just that they took the absolutely extreme case, which had huge confidence in a, you know, uh, interval around it. And they, they took the, the top of the confidence. It was a 23rd is the year. Well, I can just see on Fox News, all these talking heads talking about 2030 being the end of the world and then showing pristine pictures of around the United States and saying, this is the end of the world. I want to be there. That's what I mean by people who are exaggerating and not giving straight information, you know. Anyway, you, you ask about one thing. You can do a lot of things, but this is one thing that I say I think we're doing wrong. Okay. And Nate, what do you think? What is one thing that we need to do in order to get some, some momentum and progress going in uh, sustainability? Well, I think that one thing is, is different for everyone. And I do think that companies truly do have the best intentions with making their products and services more sustainable because I think customers do want them. And the majority of people do understand that this is not, you know, putting us on a path for a planet that will be inhabitant, inhabitable by future generations. And for each company, whatever that one thing is, or each person, whatever that one thing is, may be different. But we encourage people to seek out opportunities where you can improve 
your products and services while making them simultaneously more sustainable. And if one of those things happens to be making a, a superior delivery experience for your e-commerce customers, we'd love to we'd love to chat with you. Okay. And, and Hanko, what do you think? What's one thing we need to do? I, I would bring it down to this. Mm. I think we have to relearn how to assess truth. I think that I think something happened with social media where we somehow got away from knowing and assessing what truth is and then to make a good decision making based on that. And so I would bring it down to something that actually impacts uh, and, and everyone can, has the responsibility for that one. So I, I would list that one, how to assess truth. Okay, very interesting and interesting perspectives and, and points from all three of you. And uh, I really appreciate you being a part of the panel today and, and discussing the sustainability and supply chain. Obviously, it's a huge issue that we're trying to tackle. And I think we are all agree that it is a huge challenge. It's just in what direction do we go to do that? And I think, you know, there's various stakeholders and we're all individual stakeholders as well. And we can do what we can do, but there needs to be some some overall momentum and, and movement towards sustainability and, and building that supply chain in a more sustainable way. So thank you guys very much for joining me and really, really enjoyed the discussion and debate as well. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from the New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for The New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.